Thanks very much, uh, Cheryl, and uh, thank you very much to Carol Burks, who asked me about a year ago for this uh, uh, opportunity. And uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces here and so many people who are, are dedicated to motor neurone disease. Ray's given a lovely speech there. Ray is a nice model of how that last 12 months of the disease, how tough it is, and just uh, a model of how someone can get good care. And Ray also showed a slide of the uh, Governor of Queensland uh, awarding uh, uh, Suzanne the uh, Order of Australia medal and, uh, and the awareness. And she, after that, she came up and uh, um, uh, the Governor Penny Wensley said, well, what can I do for motor neurone disease? And it's a model for those people in the area who are trying to raise awareness that Penny Wensley is now the ex-governor and probably looking to try and support things. Uh, Ray also highlighted the difficulties in that care, and I'd like to acknowledge Nicole Hutchinson, who's in the room here. Nicole should put a hand up. <laughs> uh, Nicole's the front line of uh, arranging those, uh, that care and really needs, um, 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 needs, needs acknowledgement. So I'll start uh, again. You've heard enough about the Ice Bucket Challenge, but it... Um, um, it has captivated uh, people right through from the clinicians through to the researchers through to people in this room. Um, up on the top there is Dominic Rowe and uh, our researcher is uh, Gilles Guillemon from Macquarie University. So, uh, you know, uh, they've, Macquarie's got a lovely website uh, highlighting uh, what they've uh, uh, done. Now, it has led to confusion. My 10-year-old did, did it and wasn't quite sure. She said she's doing it for owls. And, uh, and when it first came out, um, um, and it does highlight that difficulty of the, the terminology of motor neurone disease. I mean, the Americans are just as likely to know it as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, the French is Charcot's disease. And Australia is uh, pretty clearly MND. And so suddenly we had this owls diagnosis. And it reminded me uh, uh, many years ago, um, Rod Harris might even remember the governor of uh, New uh, Victoria um, introduced a speech and uh, had had ALS slash MND and um, she uh, gave a speech on Alzmind um, <laughs> as, a, as a disease. And uh, um, it, it highlights, because I, I do think they are, they're very close diagnoses but they're not exact. And I'll uh, use a little bit of my latest slide to also illustrate that point. Because I think ALS is uh, the disease that we know as the dreadful disease with an average survival of two to three years, where a point that I'll come back to again, where you've got uh, involvement of the nerves of the spinal cord and brain, and also involvement of the nerves and wasting of the muscle outside the spinal cord. And that's ALS. MND includes other variants which can be much slower and about 10% of motor neurone disease actually runs quite a slow course, sometimes beyond 10 years. And it, um, you know, for example, Stephen Hawking, you know, I think it's fair to say he has motor neurone disease, but I don't think that's what I would call ALS. Um, and I still remember talking to his neurologist at a meeting a few years ago and saying, does he really have motor neurone disease? And his neurologist said, well, he's still got reflexes. And this is uh, English neurologist Nigel Lee that David Oliver <laughs> might know. So I think he was affronted at the question, but um, it, um, it raises the point um, about involvement of upper and lower motor neurons that I'll come to in a, in a minute in this uh, talk. So... Um, this is what Janet uh, Nash is uh, sitting down the front, and Janet, Janet's um, been uh, tireless for the MNDRIA, and they're really, as uh, uh, I think uh, Carol highlighted, they're really uh, generating a lot of money for research. And she sends out this, and I, I apologise it's small writing, but I, got, I was uh, doing some research for this talk, and I noticed you've got a new one. So um, they're clearly the money from the ice, buck challenge, ice bucket challenges are generating money and it is going towards research. And uh, um, I believe two millions um, uh, mentioned by David uh, has uh, been generated. So, uh, you know, that it will generate significant uh, funding for research. Uh, so my talk today, which I hope to cover a little bit on, and, and clearly it's a, a very large area to talk about, is a little bit about some updates, really, in cause, diagnosis, treatment, and management. And then I'll just focus a little bit on some uh, local research that uh, is happening. But clearly, Shu, later in the talk, is going to uh, highlight that a little bit more. So 
Uh, actually, someone mentioned the Forbes Norris uh, medal, uh, Carol did, and uh, Orla Hardiman uh, re received that award, uh, not last year, I think, but the year before. And uh, she's a, uh, a fantastically tireless uh, neurologist from uh, Ireland who uh, um, wrote that statement that you can read up there about motor neurone disease. And the genetics of motor neurone disease is an area that is evolving. So it's fair to say that 90% of motor neurone disease patients will not pass it on to their children and that about 10% will pass it on often with quite a high chance of one in two uh, of the next generation uh, receiving uh, that diagnosis. But uh, the discovery of a new gene called the C9ORF72, which I'll show on my next slide, has really changed our thinking as neurologists and as geneticists. So down on the bottom, in those patients who are in labs, uh, particularly some centres internationally, you can almost, if you've got a family history of motor neurone disease, that figure is almost up to 60% now that a gene can be identified in your family and up to 10% of sporadic motor neurone disease. In Australia, um, up to 7% of uh, cases of motor neurone disease with no family history will have a, a C9ORF72 mutation. So, so far there's actually 13 genes that have been discovered and Sheffield uh, University in uh, UK uh, is offering a panel that now has all of those 13 genes. In Australia, we really only got two that are widely available gene tests, and that's the SOD1 mutation and the C9ORF72 mutation. And uh, Professor Garth Nicholson's lab in uh, uh, New South Wales uh, is also doing research on two other ones called the FUS and the TDP43. So um, SOD1, um, in some ways, uh, SOD1, which was um, um, first discovered more than 20 years ago, has, some, has somewhat distracted researchers uh, um, because it's not the perfect model. The pathology is not exactly the same in the cases that don't have the SOD1 mutation. And uh, perhaps um, um, the animal models for the SOD1 mutation have been frustrating for researchers because their treatments that appear to have some benefit in the SOD1 uh, mouse have not been able to easily translate uh, into humans. So then in the mid-2000s, two other genes were discovered, as I've written up there. They're quite rare genes, and practically, they don't seem to interact with what we're doing um, at the front line. Um, but the last one, the C9ORF72, clearly is. So the, um, it was only discovered about two and a half years ago. And as, as you can see there, the actual proportion of patients who may have that gene mutation uh, is significantly higher. But that's raised a really tough issue, all right? So um, it overlaps with a, a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia, and it raises really tough issues for those family members who uh, have a relative who's been diagnosed with uh, uh, a C9ORF72 mutation. Do we know if uh, other relatives uh, are going to carry that one in two risk of developing the disease? Do we know? What the, whether they're going to get frontotemporal dementia, psychosis, or motor neurone disease. Um, do we know that they could have a chance that uh, they could live a normal life without developing any manifestations of disease? So those, the patients are asking those questions. Um, and uh, you know, as neurologists, we've got to get our act together to try and come up with some sensible answers, because it is a real challenge. So a couple of slides on C9ORF72 because I do think that is a, a, a game changer for uh, people. It'll be a game changer if there is an animal model uh, for this disease. And it's a, a game changer because it's much more common and it probably better represents the pathology of motor neurone disease than the previous models. And it um, has perhaps highlighted that the disease is probably something that's more central rather than peripheral. So the original description, and I've got up there on the far right, Charco, who was the one who originally made the uh, discovery of motor neurone disease, and he thought the pathology was in the spinal cord. And so that's why um, up in the top left, I'm showing you what's called the anterior horn cell, which is where people thought the pathology was. However, I think uh, the discovery of the um, overlap uh, with frontotemporal dementia suggests that the pathology is actually 
uh, uh, more centrally. Now practically that doesn't make a lot of difference for uh, patients with motor neuron disease. Probably less than 10% of patients have actually frontotemporal dementia. When it's properly tested in proper clinical studies by neuropsychologists and by other people using proper batteries for assessing frontotemporal dementia, it might be up to 30%. But I'll tell you what, in the clinic, I'm struggling to be able to identify those patients who have uh, frontotemporal dementia, uh, have mild cognitive involvement uh, from those who don't. So, um, the um, the function of that gene c 9 off 72 is not well understood. Um, it probably now has something to do with RNA processing, which I'll come to in a later slide. Um, but without animal models, we've still got work to do. And um, as I said, it, it's really raised a very tough issue for other family members when someone has that c 9 off 72 mutation. But what it also highlights is that um, um, trying to obtain research samples, blood or other samples from patients becomes now critically important because those patients, particularly uh, if they have an opportunity to be able to donate uh, tissue for research, will inform later generations because I really do think that more gene discoveries will be made. It's likely that the other genes that get discovered in the future will actually be quite rare in any one individual, but I think the numbers are increasing. So they struck, it, struck gold with the CNI and ORF72, um, but the researchers who discovered that feel that any other mutation is now going to be a whole ho host of little rarer ones. And as I said, for the majority of patients, 90% of patients, uh, it doesn't mean a lot because um, uh, they're essentially not going to be passing on that um, disease to their family members. So this is just uh, some note points when, um, from last week when I uh, tried to put together what the latest research is in the C9-ORF72 mutation. It doesn't predict a typical disease. Just like the SOD1 mutation doesn't say that patients have got a good or bad variety of motor neuron disease, the SOD1, the C9-ORF72 appears to be just as common in those patients with rapid disease, slow disease. There's probably a little bit more involvement of patients who have bulbar involvement, that is involved involvement of their speech and swallow. But um, some cases, and um, you do see this in the clinic, that there are some patients who don't neatly fit into a diagnosis of motor neuron disease. They overlap with other diagnoses, uh, like progressive supranuclear palsy or Parkinson's disease. There's some patients who've just got a little bit of an overlap, and it may well be that some of those patients actually have the C9-ORF72 mutation. Um, the, uh, so just because a patient has frontotemporal dementia does not mean they'll necessarily have the C9-ORF72 mutation is also quite clear. So as I said, the pathology, um, let's see if this pointer works. Yeah, the pathology is the TDP43 inclusion. So it's probably a much better marker for the disease than the SOD1 mutation because that's the pathology that is present uh, in 80 to 90% of patients with motor neuron disease. And what they have found is that this is an expanded repeat. It's uh, a, a similar type of disease that uh, is found in diseases such as spinocerebellar ataxia and myotonic dystrophy, where the longer the repeat that you have, the abnormal repeat, it may indicate shorter survival. So also just a recent update, um, the idea of toxic proteins. So the evidence is pointing that the long nerves of motor nerves is what makes them susceptible to abnormalities. And the problem of trying to get signals from inside the cell, called the, uh, inside the nucleus where the DNA is made, out into the cytoplasm where there's RNA, there's some sort of defective process occurring there, and that longer nerves seem to be more affected. And beyond that, I think it's pretty complex. So motor neuron disease, um, as all of you people in this audience would know it, um, remains largely a diagnosis that's clinical. Uh, Samar's here in the audience and um, she's doing research into this area and I think it's an area that neurologists do struggle with um, and uh, it is a difficult area 
um, to try and be confident of that diagnosis and equally um, if you're not confident in the diagnosis and the patients think you're not confident of the diagnosis and then you've really got, you know, you've got a real difficulty trying to connect uh, with, your, with the patient and that's a, a real challenge. Uh, Ray highlighted a second opinion, um, sometimes uh, is, uh, is helpful, but there are cases that really remain um, uh, are quite difficult to diagnose. Some of the work that's been done through the Motor Neuron Disease Registry indicate that you know, it's probably from when a first patient first noticed symptoms to when they actually received the diagnosis should be around about 12 months, but in Australia it's probably even a little bit longer. Um, so it's, it's quite surprising how long that takes and it's the challenge of trying to get an effective therapy is you want to be giving the therapy at the start, not 12 months down the track. So um, what I, I just want to highlight a little bit is that the clinical phenotype matters. So what I mean by that is that in making a diagnosis, you're usually trying to combine involvement of the nerves out in the periphery with the nerves centrally. And I'll show you in the next slide what I mean by that, but that's what indicates motor neuron disease. Rarely, about less than 5% of, uh, of the time, patients will present with uh, actually respiratory involvement as their first symptom, and about 5% of the time, patients will actually present with um, actual frank frontotemporal dementia. And usually it's the family of the key there in uh, just uh, um, um, helping us. Um, but there are two varieties that are probably just as common. One is more of a behavioural type, where patients become quite rigid in their thinking, they're changing their pattern of behaviour, often workplace issues, family-based issues. And then there's a language type of issue, which patients have less trouble with their ability, with more, sorry, have more trouble with the ability to name and their uh, construction of, uh, of their sentences. So, um, We've been trying to come up with a score to try and grade involvement of the clinical phenotype. And I don't expect you to read all of that, but it's really trying to identify the features of patients which indicate involvement of the peripheral nerve versus involvement of the central nerves. And uh, um, in some ways, that's quite a very handy method of seeing. And so clearly patients who've got more involvement outside one arm more in, or, or one leg, more involvement, uh, are more likely to be able to be confidently diagnosed with motor neuron disease and appear to have uh, uh, reduced survival. And this is some uh, slides, a little bit old, from uh, Paul Talman in Vic uh, Victoria. Uh, Paul um, um, has headed the Australian Motor Neuron Disease Registry, but it just, uh, the things such as the registry help inform about what motor neuron disease is. So I know this slide's a little bit difficult, but the average age, around about uh, 60, and it's slightly more common in men, and that it's about 1.2 is to 1, uh, should be what the ratio of motor neuron disease is, men to women. In our clinic, it's more like 1.5 uh, is to 1. And we sort of stopped and thought, well, why would we have more males and uh, uh, females? And uh, I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, I think sometimes um, the males uh, develop the disease a bit younger and might be a little bit more likely to be involved with a neurologist based clinic, whereas the older patients might be a little bit more likely to be involved more with palliative care services. Um, so there's the age distribution. I know it's hard to see, but the males are a little more common, particularly at the younger age, where you see the green bar outstrips the uh, purple bar, and on the other side, it's very slightly more women. Um, Yep, can't reach my pointer over there, but uh, um, that's on the top right. And then where the disease starts really seems to be pretty similar across the three main areas of involvement. So you're just as likely to start in your legs as your arms as bulbar involvement. As I said, women are a little bit more likely to start in the bulbar area. Men are a little bit more likely to start in the, uh, um, what we call the cervical area, which is the arm. And this is the last of these slides, but it's really just trying to explore that issue of uh, the different, um, this is what the Australian Motor Neuron Disease Registry has really helped inform, is that um, the women in the purple here are more common at an older age uh, for bulbar onset. So, and that's what you see is that in the clinic is the older, older woman with uh, bulbar onset disease. 
and the cervical one where you get the man involved with uh, arm involvement. And so that research has uh, been very helpful from the motor neuron disease registry and the MNDRA has helped support that. Whereas legs, it's a little less clear. If there's early breathing involvement, it's, it's more likely to be uh, uh, the male. And one complex slide, the genetics have not helped us really better understand what pattern of, of disease people are likely to get. Um, I still remember one of our, um, um, you know, really remember uh, Peter very well, who has uh, contributed so much to our research, and his disease lasted more than 10 years, and yet his sister uh, passed away within a year of, uh, of uh, symptoms. So um, I'll touch a little bit on uh, clinical trials. So there has been, and uh, people might be surprised about this, but there has been a lot of <coughs> clinical trials in the last 20 years. The only trial that has shown any benefit is the trial Rilizol, which was in the mid-90s. And there were two trials. The question could be raised whether they actually did the, uh, they got the dose right, because um, that's one of the challenges uh, that if you're trying to rush a trial, you may not necessarily test the different doses uh, correctly. Um, and it's clear that any benefit from Rilizol is pretty modest. In the clinic, we would certainly say we don't see any difference between the patients who are on Rilizol and those who aren't. If we stack our numbers up, the patients who are on Rilizol probably have had longer survival than those who aren't by a certain uh, number of months. Uh, however, it, it could well be biased because those patients who took Rilizol might have been a little more motivated uh, to take it. So, a lot of the other neurology drugs, and I've only listed a small amount there, if you go to things such as their ALSA Association website in the US, they've got quite a large list of uh, drugs. Um, and what I guess those trials have uh, helped uh, identify for us is how to design these studies. So I guess even though some of these trials have been unsuccessful, they're giving us more and more information about how to try and uh, conduct a proper clinical trial. <clears throat> now, I, I should mention respiratory, so that in mentioning drug therapies that have made a difference, the only other thing that's made a difference is respiratory. So the use of non-invasive ventilation can prolong survival by up to 12 months in those patients who take it. And so that's what that's trying to show, that in all comers there's about a 12-month survival. In those patients who can't tolerate the non-invasive ventilation, clearly there's not much benefit from it. Um, whereas those who can get a benefit of about a year. That's the separation of the um, blue and the red graphs. So that clearly is an effective therapy and uh, it highlights um, that um, um, that's an old picture, that's an old mask. The modern masks are a lot uh, more manageable to use and it highlights the fact that um, uh, the involvement of respiratory physicians in this area. And so um, we have now do a clinic. Uh, Nicole uh, goes to P Princess Alexandra Hospital, and I uh, go to, uh, uh, with Nicole to the Prince Charles Hospital. I notice Stacey's uh, down there as a speech pathologist who's now part of that Prince Charles uh, Hospital clinic. And uh, it just highlights that, uh, the, um, that that should be something that can be offered. It's not without many, many issues, um, in, involves issues of about um, when to consider feeding, when to consider withdrawal of ventilation, when to consider the burden on uh, other caregivers. Um, so it, um, it's one of those uh, complex areas that are involved. So I'll touch on a, a couple of the recent trials. So at the Royal Brisbane, uh, the two major ones that we've been involved, which have been funded by large pharmaceutical companies in the US, um, have had the terms Empower and its extension phase Envision and the NOG study, which is only just finishing. And the other, um, so uh, the NOG study was also with Prince of Wales in uh, Sydney and the Empower study was also with both Sydney and uh, also Paul Talman and Susan Mather's uh, centre uh, in Victoria. And um, both of them, uh, well, sorry, the Empower and Envision were not successful. The NOG study has finished, and we're waiting to see uh, if uh, the results, which probably will be out in about December. And so in those studies, uh, and it's a tough study for patients because they've got a 50-50 chance of being on the therapy or being on placebo. 
Um, their, their infusional studies, both of them um, had very little side effect in terms of, uh, of, the, of for the patients. So that, in one, on the one hand, was very effective. Um, but, but equally, I haven't seen any huge turnaround uh, in actual the patient outcomes. So um, some of the issues that um, um, really those trials help inform us on is the um, um, recruitment um, um, criteria to put patients in the trial. Uh, someone naively uh, said, um, you know, you neurologists just put patients on the trial that you want to still be um, going okay in a year or two's time. And that's really not what we really want to know about a, in a trial. We want to know, is this trial making a difference? How do you really assess uh, treatment? I'll show in a, uh, uh, a treatment effect is one of the other um, uh, major issues. And so there is a, a functional rating scale called the ALS-FRS that many people here would be familiar with. And that combined with survival seems to be about the best measure, along with measures of breathing function. Measures of muscle strength are quite uh, difficult, as I'll show. Uh, in those studies, uh, particularly the EMPOWER study, those patients who are on Rilazole clearly seem to have a bit better survival than those who weren't. However, the study wasn't powered or wasn't designed to look at that and you really got to be very careful in making any uh, um, conclusions based uh, on when that's not what you set out to do. And um, trying to assess efficacy is what I'm trying to say with use of uh, that ALS-FRS plus survival. There are more studies, so there are more trials and we're certainly putting our hands uh, up uh, as are other centres in Sydney and uh, uh, Victoria uh, to participate in studies. Some of them are quite novel, some of them are using quite novel methods of uh, assessing um, markers of the disease including blood and uh, even spinal fluid and some are, are using um, um, novel types of imaging techniques using MRI and PET. Um, that's uh, one that um, 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 it's, a, it's a long process for putting out um, an expression of interest and trying to get involved in clinical studies to actually getting them started. Um, but, you know, uh, that's what's needed to make a difference uh, uh, in terms of the underlying disease. So the issues of clinical trials. So I, I mentioned about muscle strength testing, but we've had a, a number of patients, and that's why I've got that terrible picture there up on the top right. I mean. It's, it's very different trying to assess someone who started off much stronger than you. Um, you know, our two research nurses have to assess muscle strength and uh, um, basically them, the patient's muscle strength if, if, is, can only be related to the tester's muscle strength um, because if they're still stronger than the tester, they're, the, what they're measuring will be the tester's muscle strength. Um, so. Um, there really is poor markers of the disease and that's where there's a real need for proper biomarkers of the disease. Um, it's an area that everyone says, and if you go to uh, international meetings, everyone says, well, there's a clear need for it, but it just hasn't been coming in the last uh, um, five to ten years that I've been involved. Survival is not a good marker. It's not necessarily representing what really is happening to the disease. The use of non-invasive ventilation, okay, maybe only 20 to 30 percent of people uh, choose uh, to use non-invasive ventilation, but the disease is still progressing despite the use of uh, uh, interventions such as that. A PEG probably doesn't necessarily affect survival, but probably does affect quality of life. But uh, non-invasive ventilation certainly does. And some patients um, pass away for reasons um, totally unrelated to uh, the actual disease process. And we've certainly seen that where someone may have a heart attack or other reasons and may have had a, a slower survival. And basically they're not really properly studying a disease when you're only looking at 12 months of the disease. So basically um, these clinical trials work on a number of about 20% of patients will pass away in 12 months. Well, you know, I don't think that's a particularly good marker of the disease. So really the only things that correlate, and certainly when we look at our analyses, it's age and bulba involvement. Um, giving a talk here really um, wouldn't be complete uh, without stem mentioning stem cells. So um, those of you at the front line, um, you know, that the question of stem cells um, comes up fairly frequently uh, in the clinic. 
you know, um, even just the last couple of weeks, a patient, or two patients have contacted me about um, uh, stem cells, uh, particularly in China. But there's been uh, phases where patients have been going to India, Germany, and Italy. Um, Italy and Germany um, have closed theirs down, and someone sort of uh, described it that um, in um, in developed countries, usually they'll get about three years. The the dodgy company that uh, sets up the stem cells before their own government will close them down. But that hasn't been the case, uh, particularly in uh, Delhi and India. So. Um, um, originally, I used to say, you know, to patients um, about stem cells, well, I don't see any great problem with uh, um, uh, seeking different uh, uh, therapies as long as it's not going to cause you side effects, cause you great uh, expense, or take you away from being with the people you want to be, be with. And that's where going to India and spending six months is just uh, uh, a silly choice. So those three things, but um, I quite like this, which I found on the uh, internet in the last couple of weeks about warning signs. So the one it, which is the current flavour of the month is these Chinese military hospitals that uh, patients in Australia are, are going and seeking information about. Um, we've got uh, one patient who's got the money to be able to send someone over there to actually investigate it. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what he says, but um, um, those are some um, uh, helpful pointers for uh, trying to say, well, is there any role for it? So um, clinical care, and I guess many people here in this room are involved in that clinical and community care, and that's where the real challenge lies. So here we are in the nice, it's not quite sunny today, but uh, here we are right down here in the Gold Coast. Um, notice Armin Sabat's uh, here from the Gold Coast Hospital, and. Uh, um, and he has a dedicated interest here in motor neuron disease, but um, it's a really big state. And so same in South Australia, Western Australia, uh, and to a lesser extent, New South Wales, Victoria, and um, not to forget Northern Territory and Tasmania. It's a big country. So telehealth uh, is one opportunity that really does uh, offer uh, offer that opportunity. Um, that's an old slide of uh, Nicole and I, um, and the TVs have improved. We've got proper screens, <laughs> and uh, we run it at um, also at Prince Charles Hospital, and uh, Stacey uh, here will know about that. Um, but it's a good opportunity to involve uh, palliative care, respiratory, and uh, neurology. Uh, but what I think really drives it, and what I think uh, really stimulates us to really try and keep going with telehealth, is the uh, need for locally. So patients, particularly when they have trouble getting uh, to um, um, the Royal Brisbane, no one really wants to come to the Royal Brisbane Hospital. It's a horrible hospital. Um, it's um, great, you know, car parking $16 an hour. Um, imagine trying to get from um, um, the car park right up to the seventh floor. Um, it's a, it's, it's a telehealth where you can go to a local uh, facility, involvement of your whole family, which is locally, uh, and also uh, the local allied health providers. And I think that's what's uh, really stimulated me, and uh, um, Nicole might have a, a comment in the break, is also the role of the local health providers, usually nursing or allied health, uh, who really drive this. And it really offers a lot of uh, opportunity. Where it's been particularly good has been those patients who have started uh, non-invasive ventilation, because I think we really had the idea that um, it's gonna be very difficult to support that intervention outside of Brisbane. But telehealth has really changed my idea there and uh, the involvement of sleep nurses um, who uh, coordinate care um, really means that patients can have quality of life outside the big centres. And then there's a role for multidisciplinary care. And I think um, we've got to be honest with ourselves that, um, and you know, Ray perhaps uh, highlighted that, that our involvement, particularly in that last 12 months, um, is, you know, we, we're really kidding ourselves if we're having a big involvement. People like Nicole are, people like the Motor Neurone Disease Associations, people like the care providers are, that the, are involved with those patients in the last uh, 12 months. But what we've tried to do is multidisciplinary um, uh, care. And I guess, I think I saw on the um, um, program, Sarah Solomon's uh, talking from uh, Bethlehem. And they, I guess, were a model in Australia for how you provide uh, multidisciplinary care. So involvement of um, um, 
um, palliative care services, respiratory services and neurology services are probably the um, usually the three main components. Involvement right across uh, allied health. Uh, I still remember giving a talk five years ago and forgetting the social worker and I mean that's very silly because that's, um, um, that's something that uh, Royal Brisbane we've uh, lacked that sort of involvement. So just to touch on um, Queensland Research, uh, Dr Shu No um, is going to talk this afternoon. She's one of those uh, very passionate young researchers, I think you can still call you young Shu, um, who, um, who really are the future of battling this disease. And we've got another one, a guy, uh, uh, Matthew Devine, who uh, you've just got to keep those young people, you've got to get them when they've got smart minds, not clotted cluttered up with all the rest of the stuff that gets cluttered up in med medical school and when working as a junior doctor in a hospital, um, which sort of um, deprives you of all the opportunity to uh, actually think freely. And uh, you need those people to uh, get involved and promote it in research. And I think um, the MNDRIA uh, clearly recognises that uh, real focus on getting uh, teams together and getting smart young people. And so on that slide, what I'm really just highlighting is the role of biomarkers. So trying to have b better biomarkers, some of our focuses have been trying to use blood, te blood uh, others in uh, uh, using MRI and some using that uh, electrophysiology. But Ray also highlighted that uh, Suzanne donated other parts of her body from, for research and some of that uh, has allowed a, a reasonable uh, biobank, brain bank to be established uh, to try and better understand research because some of the genetic markers are better obtained from uh, non-blood samples. So um, just in the last uh, five or ten minutes, is that okay? Five minutes? Um, that some of the di distinctive features of motor neuron disease and some of the research that Matt's done um, is that, um, that motor neuron disease really is quite asymmetric and focal. Um, so he's done a study with 138 patients across Royal Brisbane and Prince of Wales uh, Hospital. Nice example of collaborative research. And he's tried to look at limb dominance and where about where does the disease start. So if you're right-handed, 90% of you in this audience will be right-handed. Um, your chance is that it will be more likely to start in your right upper limb, but it's not, it's not huge. Uh, it took us a large number to actually show that. Um, in your legs, it's pretty even where the disease starts. We all walk the same. Um, we, it's not variable uh, how we use our right or left legs, um, but it does affect how we use our arms. So what about spread? So you're not going to be able to read this slide, but basically um, the last point is that this is patients, and basically patients say there is no set pattern. They really don't know how spread uh, occurs. But Ian Davis... Um, like eventually like a sort of progressive like mine started off in my left foot but now um, I'm in a wheelchair and my left hand's going but yeah so what what we've discovered is that handedness actually matters most in how the disease spreads so if you're right handed like 90% of people then you've got a very high likelihood that the disease in the left side will, will spread on the left side it suggests that something's driving it it suggests that something's driving it up centrally so where Matt then took it a little step further was to link it with patients and say, well, was it those patients who had wasting and weakness, so the things out in the nerve, or was it the brisk reflexes and the increased tone or spasticity? And it's very clearly the latter. So what he's really nicely shown is uh, that what's driving the disease, that handedness has got some effect. It sort of supports the idea there's something about stress of neurons that uh, help drive this disease. So handedness is important and it practically has helped us in the clinic and that you've got about an 80% chance that that pattern will occur um, and it's helped us in even trying to make the diagnosis earlier. So for the average patient uh, who comes in with one arm involved will usually be the other arm that's involved next partic and if they're right handed and it starts in their right upper limb that, that rule is pretty much the, the norm. So some of those things have been very handy. And uh, um, then Matt's also taken it, there'll be a few speech pathologists here in this room, and Matt's uh, taken that a bit further because he then had a questionnaire where he asked uh, um, patients about their involvement of speech and swallow. And um, he had 39 consecutive patients who had some bulbar involvement, 
Um, um, more than half of them actually started in the speech in Swallow. And he asked them which came first, speech or Swallow? And independently got the, uh, a, another person in their family to say, well, w when did it start? So um, he then described them according to different phenotypes, which I won't go through. But it's very common for speech to pre uh, be more, uh, occur before swallow. And practically, that's what really is what you see in the clinic, with one exception. So 74% <laughs> said their speech was involved first, and it was a mean delay of a number of months before involvement of swallow. Now, maybe that's just bias and patients can better identify their speech more than their uh, swallow difficulties. But I think what the swallow is, is a reflex. And so Anna Farrell's the speech pathologist who hopefully can take this further. But the uh, swallow is really a reflex, whereas the speech is something that really has to come from the um, uh, thinking part of the brain. And so really that's uh, suggesting that's what's involved with motor neuron disease. And what Matt nicely showed was that it was linked to those people who had the brisk reflexes. So we had that idea, and then the next patient in the clinic, we asked them that same question, speech and swallow, and they said, my swallow first. <laughs> but, but, that patient actually, we didn't really identify it until a few months later, had quite significant breathing involvement. So I guess that really then educated us, A, that we don't know everything, and B, that, um, that um, once you've got breathing involvement, um, your swallow becomes very important. And those speech pathologists here in this room will understand that, that it takes a lot of effort to um, have, the, have your uh, swallow. And so once patients are starting to get breathing involvement, those questions of uh, nutrition and swallow become important. And also, um, this is one of our uh, um, loved patients who uh, just illustrates the cognitive involvement. And she was a very good painter. Um, and uh, that's one of her early works, then a mid middle of the disease work and a late work. Now clearly some of it was due to not having hands and clearly I haven't um, been able to display it that well, but it just illustrates the difficulty and the importance of thinking about cognition. And that's one thing that we're really struggling with in the clinic, is trying to get better markers of cognition. There are two standard tests, and there's work being done uh, at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Sydney to better understand that. So um, you know, we've had many uh, patients who participate in our research, many patients who love us, um, are raising awareness. And I just think the, the opportunity for the, um, the uh, associations is really, um, it's a golden time to try and raise awareness. And it's a golden time to really highlight uh, where uh, research is um, uh, going and the efforts of the MNDRIA. Um, look, that, that slide there just illustrates the funding that's supplied by the MNDRIA uh, across Australia. Janet's getting quite excited in the front row here. <laughs> so I would like to acknowledge uh, those people who funded us and uh, all of the people who uh, um, um, have participated in the centres that are involved in our research. Um, I think collaborative research is important. I think multidisciplinary care is the only way to really tackle this disease that we've got to try and work together. Um, and it's so much more difficult with limited resources that exist, particularly through the, uh, particularly through the government organisations, such that uh, um, what you're doing and what uh, just in uh, coming here to increase your knowledge and increase your awareness and network is really what this disease is critical about. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Now, Rob has kindly said he will take any questions from the floor. There are roving mics if anyone would like to put their hand up for any questions for Dr. Rob. Just send them down here. Thank you. Rob, thank you very Peter Alcock from South Australia. Um, we too struggle with cognitive issues and I disagree with a lot of people who say, well, we can't do anything about it, so why bother? I've been tossing up looking at what tools do you I've discovered that EKs in the last few months, but it's not a screening test, it's a good half an hour for easily. And we've got no good access to neuropsych, that's you know, six months waiting list, which is clearly too long. In the EKs, I've just wondered, is just asking the carers about behaviour enough? So how do you cope with it in the clinic? Yeah, nice, uh, nice to put a face to it, Peter. Um, the, I mean, that's a, 
um, nicely illustrates, and they have the same problems that we have. You've got just keeping it very simple, FTD has two types, the language type and the uh, behavioural type. The behavioural type, uh, the question is more caregivers inventory, things like that, which again we've struggled with actually practically using them in the clinic. We've been um, trying to link and uh, understand from John Hodges' group in, the New S in Prince of Wales. Uh, it's very much dependent on whether there is someone in the clinic who can uh, administer these because they do take up to half an hour but probably the ASAR and the FAB are the ones that we've been using because we're trying to tap into research. But again, uh, I don't necessarily think they're the good markers. I think what we need in the clinic is something quite practical. Um, thank you. Uh, Rod Harris, after that, thank you. Rod Harris, Motor Neuron Victoria. Uh, Rob, you've mentioned a lot about uh, genetic material, blood, the, uh, the brain banks, the MND registry. I just wonder if it's about time that the MND community invested on a, on a recurrent basis in the collection of bloods and brain banks and uh, spinal cord tissue and the MND registry uh, over a long period of time, because they seem to be the tools that we're increasingly needing. So should we really be saying to the Research Institute this is something we've got to focus on. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Rod. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd be totally in agreement with you. Clearly, the Research Institute's got a pretty uh, good group of smart people who'll decide their own um, priorities. Um, I think it's critically important that a biobank um, is done properly so that uh, it needs to be properly maintained and it needs to be properly ethically set up such that it can distribute research and samples. And I think those are some of the reasons that everyone struggled um, because you've got to do it over a long term um, uh, commitment. And that's what uh, most research funding is basically one to three years, and that's just not sufficient to be able to fund a proper biobank. But Rod Harris is right on the money that that's, um, if that could happen, that could really position Australia as a, a great, uh, uh, because we're quite a confined uh, island, that it, would, it could set us up in a great, uh, a, great, uh, a great way in terms of research. Yes, Janet. Rob, I presume that uh, genetic testing is available for family members of people with the C9 or 72 gene. And I'm wondering, do you know if relatives of people with so-called sporadic mutations have been tested, and if so, have been years of the positive? Yeah. Uh, look, that, uh, so repeating Janet's question, which is the minefield of C9 or 72, and uh, genetic testing and also the families of sporadic members, uh, have they been seeking uh, testing? Um, so at the moment, um, uh, the sporadic community probably hasn't been focusing so much on it that I'm aware, not, aware of. The test that you can do for C9 off 72 uh, costs $700 through Garth Nicholson's laboratory in Sydney, so it's a pretty um, difficult for you to just go and send your blood there through a public hospital um, that blood can be sent there but I think people would only be doing it uh, in the setting of proper genetic counselling and uh, also um, uh, through um, you, you'd want to be taking a proper family history. What we've really struggled with is the genetic counselling aspect of it, uh, a the access to genetic counsellors who really understand the disease and what really are the implications of a positive disease because out there there is going to be a lot of people who uh, have uh, um, a positive C9 or 72, what does it really mean? But that hasn't, uh, to be specific about uh, Janet's question, um, in my, f from the Queensland perspective, is it, it isn't, hasn't hit the sporadic community. One more question. Do we have one more question? Time for one more for anyone. Okay, I'd like to thank Dr. Rob Henderson. Thank, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you.